During the 2016 campaign, President-elect Trump called President Obama the worst president in U.S. history. And while President Obama called his successor uh, temperamentally unfit to be the commander-in-chief. But in about an hour and a half, the two will meet at the White House and begin the time-honored transition process. Here you see the president-elect's plane at LaGuardia Airport set to take off for Washington, D.C. You know, I've actually been in that plane, Anne-Marie. Really? Yeah, I got to interview a president-elect Trump uh, right before he announced his candidacy for the presidency he's in a, that plane. and he, um, he, He's about to get an upgrade uh, on the yeah, plane, I think. I don't know. That plane is sick. Really? It's really cool. Mm -hmm. John Dickerson is CBS News political director and moderator of Face the Nation. John, we are going to witness a very interesting meeting today. Uh, the president is hosting the president-elect at the White House. What typically takes place during this sort of meeting? Well, it's very cordial. There's a lot of ceremonial coming together. The, the campaign is behind us. We're all one nation. It's a peaceful transfer of power. So it's um, symbolically, it's uh, you know beginning to, to heal the wounds of the election. Uh, in person, uh, I'm not sure what will happen at the first meeting. There are a number of these conversations between a president and president-elect in which the president-elect is gradually brought into the most sensitive parts of the job. Um, George W. Bush gave advice, uh, little pieces of advice to Barack Obama that became more powerful as Obama carried him through office. Mm -hmm. One of the pieces of advice was use a lot of hand sanitizer, actually, <laughs> so there's news you can use. Um, and um, I don't know whether that'll happen in this meeting. I think in this case it'll probably be just kind of um, uh, getting over the fact that, you know, Donald Trump spent five years saying Barack Obama wasn't born in America and wasn't a legitimate president. Yeah. So just getting through a meeting in which they just have nice pleasantries is probably a good place to start. John, on that last point uh, about the rise of Donald Trump, um, Paul Ryan yesterday said that Donald Trump heard a voice that nobody else heard. But there seem to be two narratives about the rise of Trump. One is the disaffected, those folks who feel left behind by Washington, by both parties. But there's another narrative here, which is that he did come to prominence with birtherism, with immigrant bashing, religious bigotry, the embracement of white identity politics. Is it fair to disengage one from the other when you talk about the rise of Trump and Trumpism, or do you have to bundle them all together? Well, there are a number of different streams that led to his rise. So I think you have to be honest about what happened uh, uh, and who his and who a portion of his supporters are. I think it's a mistake to take uh, a portion of his supporters and make that the entire group. Um, I think it's also, um, you know, we have to be careful about um, people saying, you know, Donald Trump's um, uh, man or to people talking about mandates or talking about the message from the election. And if you're purely looking at a mandate, you would look at which candidate got the most human beings to vote for them. Well, if you're doing that, then you're talking about Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. So um, we just need to be smart about reading what's in the electorate and reading what the results are. And one of the challenges for Donald Trump will be he pulled off an extraordinary political feat, which is getting uh, people to vote for him. But now he has to represent an entire country. So the extent that a portion of his electorate uh, elevated him to the White House, he now has to figure out how to govern an entire country. I'm glad you brought up uh, Paul Ryan in his speech yesterday, which was somewhat complimentary. Uh, but we know that these two have had a history, an awkward history together. Um, and they're going to be meeting. Um, any comments? ground do you think that where they can start a conversation? Oh sure. Mm -hmm. Paul Ryan, he was incredibly complimentary. Mm -hmm. I mean it's now Donald Trump's signature that allows all the things Donald, that Paul Ryan has wanted to do for years to become law. So he's he's his best pal now um, and it's sort of amusing to hear Donald, uh, to hear Paul Ryan talk about the voice that Donald Trump heard. The voice that Donald Trump heard has been calling for Paul Ryan's head. <laughs> so um, uh, and I think also it's a little uh, Paul Ryan knows that voice. Paul Ryan, like many people do, understands the uh, challenges that uh, um, that uh, working class Americans have gone through. What what Donald Trump did that was uh, so politically effective was not did, not only that he heard the voice, but that those people heard themselves in him. Mm -hmm. That he spoke for them. That's the ticket. Yeah. And that's important for all lawmakers. There's a, I think there's a mistake that people make when they say anybody other than Donald Trump didn't hear these voices, didn't know these people exist. Of course people did. Of co I mean, on, in both parties, uh, they worried about these voters. They've spent their lives trying to help these voters. But that doesn't mean they were effective. Donald Trump was quite effective in speaking and to and again for those people who feel like they've been betrayed, they've been left out of the conversation, that they always get the short end of the stick, that um, the elites get to 
work things out in a way that always lets them work out fine, but that hurts other people. I mean, so that um, sentiment has been in the country, and Donald Trump was the one who was best able to commune with it. But it's a little, um, it's, it's imprecise, and it's going to be ineffective if people think that, well, he was the only one who heard this voice. Well, so to that end, Democrats in the House and the Senate issued statements that they want to work with the president-elect on areas that they might agree in, working families, infrastructure, family leave. Donald Trump himself on the campaign trail likened his movement to that of Bernie Sanders. So could we see even some very liberal lawmakers finding some, commona some commonality with the president-elect? Because Trump has said... Look, these folks are not just Republicans. They're probably some Democrats, too. Sure, absolutely. And you can add in the, you know, the 42 million or so poor uh, in America that Donald Trump uh, didn't necessarily campaign to or with, but that are just as shut out of the American system of uh, rewards and opportunity that the people who are more a part of his constituency and the sort of the rural non-college uh, uh, worker. So absolutely. Now, the, that's a challenge for Donald Trump if, in fact, he's going to talk to those whose voices have not been heard, who don't have uh, a voice in the corridors of power, mm -hmm. then he's got a huge group of Americans who would also fit that profile. And we'll see whether that's, in fact, his um, his goal or whether he just uh, takes care of the people who voted for him. Mm -hmm. What about the future of the Democratic Party? Who is the face of the Democratic Party moving forward now? Excellent question. Do they have uh, a bench? <laughs> well, um, they have a bench. They have some stars within the party. I mean, certainly Elizabeth Warren, certainly Bernie Sanders. There will be an interesting conversation in the Democratic Party. Donald Trump decided, I'm going to run the way I want to run, and all the smart, elite, fancy uh, strategists in the party are all wrong. And they, he, a lot of people snickered, and then he went and won an election. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there will be a lot of Democrats who say, you know, we're going to finally run as, a po as populists in this party. We're going to run more like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, and not like the, the sort of um, triangulating, third-way, corporate-connected Democratic Party. So there's going to be a real conversation in the Democratic Party. And the question is, who represents what wings? We know about Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Um, certainly Chuck Schumer, the Democrat Democratic leader in the Senate is going to have a really interesting job. He likes to get deals done. Donald Trump likes to get deals done. They are from roughly uh, the same neck of the woods. Uh, and that'll be a really interesting relationship to watch. That's a get business done relationship, not so much a lead uh, the new generation of Democrats job. And that question is, that's still a post that's yet to be filled by a, a Democrat out there. John, because you're a walking history book, um, you talked about uh, the advice that uh, President Bush <laughs> gave. On very little sleep, yes, so don't sanitizer. make it hard. Uh, no, so <laughs> I, I love the advice that I'm told that Ronald Reagan gave to President Bill Clinton, which is learn how to properly salute. The, apparently, Bill Clinton was, you know, he was sort of very lackadaisical about so uh, and Reagan was always a Christian. We're on the eve of Veterans Day. Is that, was that a true story? I don't know that I've heard that. There was a, um, there, there was an apocryphal version of that that was used to make uh, Bill Clinton, you know, to kind of run him down, the idea that he didn't care enough about the military to learn mm. how to salute. So, um, yeah, but, it, but it could actually, I haven't heard that story. I'm not challenging it, but <laughs> uh, I also know that there was this kind of, uh, this idea that, you know, Bill Clinton didn't care enough to, to, to learn how to. So, uh, but that's a really important um, job for the president because if you uh, every time you see Barack Obama get on uh, the plane or the helicopter, you know he tries to he has a crisp, crisp salute. Yeah. So, um, uh, among the things Donald Trump will have to learn is how to do that. Although exactly. he did go to military school, so that's he right. Probably, Valley Forge. He probably knows how to uh, give a crisp salute. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll uh, find one out item off the to-do list. <laughs> John Dickerson, appreciate it as always. Thank you, sir.